Hello, Solid. How's it going? Good. Thank you guys all for coming and putting down all the really important stuff that you guys are working on to be here with us today. Uh, when we started planning this conference, one of the big concerns that we had was like, we're doing a conference about building stuff. How the heck are we going to get all these people who are making all this awesome stuff to like stop building stuff and come here and like talk about it? Um, but then you did. So awesome. So thank you. Um, so one of the other things I've done in life is uh, I was a co-founder of this 3D printing company called Formlabs a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see them out in the expo area there. And uh, it's a design-focused company. You make a low-cost 3D printer that's easy to use and you know, a thing that you might actually want to use to do prototyping if you're a grad student or a small design firm or something. So I wanted to talk about bootstrapping design culture and share with you some of the philosophies which guided some of the design decisions that we made along the way. So let's start. So just for some background information, this is the Form 1. Um, it's a stereolithography 3D printer, which means that it uses some lasers and a liquid plastic resin to build up the layers of parts. Um, I'll explain more about how it works later, but um, important thing to know is that this is what it looks like today. It's, this is the shipping product. Um, it also has this accessories kit um, off to the left, which is a very um, important part of our product dev cycle as well, because we realize that if this is you know, a product that we want to have people have in their offices and workspaces, we're going to have to do something about handling the material. So we worked on designing that part of the process as well. So first, I'll share with you three pithy guiding philo philosophical phrases that we used around the office, because I've always wanted to stand on a big stage and have something like this behind me. So here it is. Um, first one is technique that we used around the office a lot was imagine yourself as the user. You know, when you're making a design decision or something about usability, think about like, OK, I'm the person using this. Do I actually want this? Do I actually care about this feature? I mean, like, we could build this because it's really fun to build this, but is it, should be, is it what we should be building? Um, another thing is focus on building a thing that works, right? Um, and this is complicated when you're in a startup because the definition of what works is like always changing all the time. Like in the early prototyping phase, you need to make something that'll prove to the VCs that you can actually make something that works, but you don't have any money. Later on, when you're making an actual product, you need to make something that works across all angles for the users. It's got to work, you know, usability-wise. If the person can't figure it out, then it doesn't mean anything. It's got to work manufacturing-wise, because let's all remember when you're designing a product for physical space, like not only do you have to be able to make it, but you also have to be able to like teach somebody else how to make it. Um, and it also has to actually work engineering-wise, because, I mean, it has to work. Uh, and the third thing is taking advantage of abstraction is very important. Um, you know, lots of people have spent lots of time solving difficult engineering problems. And so, for example, this, uh, this precision motion stage that we use for the z-axis in the printer. You know, we could have built that. Uh, we could have spent a few weeks designing and engineering it and figuring out how to integrate it and everything else, but we didn't. We bought it for $300 off of eBay so that we could focus on actually solving the real problems of like turning this idea that we had into a product. So now it's time to talk about our early prototyping process because um, basically I just want an excuse to show all of the like filthy prototyping photos from our product development cycle because that's the kind of talk that I would want to see at a conference like this. So this is prototype one. These are the parts of it. It's got a laser, it's got an XY galvanometer that shoots the laser, guides it, steers it into the tank of liquid plastic resin, and cures a layer. Um, and here's a video of it working. Uh, you can see here, this is in my basement. Um, so you can see the galvanometer's there, um, and the laser, and it draws on this mirror, and it cures some plastic. It's pretty simple, right? Real simple. That's what you would think. Um, so basically, this is our first prototype. Um, features of it included a laser pointer mounted with hot glue, um, galvanometers that we bought from China from like a laser light show. Um, we didn't have enough money for like a real digital analog converter, so we wrote a Python script that converted G-code to uh, WAV files that would then spawn an instance of Windows Media Player every single layer and played it back through a 5.1 channel sound card. Um, and it worked well enough, because that's what we needed, right? We needed, to, like, we needed to figure out if we could actually make this process inexpensive enough and then go out and prove to people that we actually could. So we did. Um, we made those parts, and they worked. They worked well enough. Now to turn it into a real product. How's that going to happen? So we started building more prototypes. We started working on the engineering stuff. And we launched industrial design in parallel as the parts started getting bigger. And this is where we really started to focus on a lot of the usability stuff. It's, in a product like this, you have to really, really integrate very tightly between the design aspects and the engineering aspects. But you also have to figure out how is this new class of product going to fit into people's lives? How is it going to fit next to their desks? How are they going to use it? How are they going to understand it? So we began to study that in earnest. You know, we knew that this resin handling thing might be a concern for people who want to have this machine in their office. So we studied every single aspect of using the product, not just how it is to use the machine, but also like what happens when you want to start a print 
and then what does it take until you actually have the print in your hand? And so we did lots of experimentation and realized that this like, finishing accessories kit was actually something we probably was going to need to spend a lot of time on. Uh, we also studied how it fits into people's offices, how it fits into their lives. You know, we realized, we found out, you know, we built this nice thing, but if you put it up against a wall, like the, the, the hinge doesn't let you open the door all the way, and so that was something that we took into consideration. Um, but then we got to the point where it was time to integrate design and engineering. Like, this is prototype four, and also like our fancy little design model, and the question became, how are we going to fit this into this? And that's when it got complicated, because it turns out we're not Apple. We don't have Foxconn by the, uh, we don't have Foxconn. And like, uh, so we realized there was like a lot of stuff we had to do, and we're going to have to cut a lot of stuff. You know, we were thinking about adding Wi-Fi integration, but we were like, wait, that's going to add a ton of engineering time. And also, has anyone made like any kind of printer that anyone actually uses the Wi-Fi setup on? Like, it's really difficult. Are we trying to do a startup to like solve how people connect to smart devices with Wi-Fi, or are we trying to like build a 3D printer? So we considered ourselves as the user, thought about what it was that we really wanted about Wi-Fi. It was like we just need to be able to not have a computer next to the thing all the time. So we came up with a nice compromise where you can like upload your print and then walk away with your computer. Um, you know, lots of other stuff. Um, this is a big firebrand. Anybody from Formlabs in the early days will look at these pictures and, and kind of roll their eyes because, you know, we talked about this, how it, the hinge doesn't fit up against the back wall. So we came up with this, like, crazy sliding hinge thing. But it was going to add tons and tons of extra complexity, add lots of extra suppliers, add lots of extra engineering time. I mean, when you're doing hardware, yeah, you can add cost by adding extra parts. But when you're doing hardware, you also exponentially increase how difficult it is to do something when you add a feature because suddenly you're tracking more things for manufacturing. You've got more parts. You've got more bomb things that you have to deal with. And so we ended up having to cut that as well. Um, so, and that allowed us to spend more time working on things that we felt were actually important to our users, you know, based on our self-consideration of what would I want as a user. Would I want a, you know, a fancy sliding hinge so I can put my machine next to a wall, or would I want a system which like, doesn't completely cover my desk in mess? And the answer was the second one, so we focused on that. Um, and so our teams got together and figured out how to integrate them, and things ended up being a whole lot more complicated than we thought they were going to be at the beginning. This is a breakaway diagram that one of our interns made, who's now actually a mainline employee at the company. Craig, I love you. So that's considerably more complicated than our prototype one, even though the, the, the basic way that it works is, is very similar. So remember, when you get to the finished shipping product stage, it always gets way more complicated. So really think about what features you're adding and why you're adding them. Um, and then, sure enough, parts started coming for our design and engineering integrated prototypes, and we started building it. It was all very exciting. Um, and then a bunch more stuff happened that I don't have time to talk about today um, that allowed us to ship it and actually make it in manufacturing. You should check out Ian Ferguson's talk this afternoon for the other side of this story, doing the engineering and design for manufacturing work of the printer. And somewhere along the way, it became a real product. It's like used by lots of people. It has all this fancy photography taken of it. And like every time I look at these pictures, I think about like, this is a nice thing. This is the thing that I want. This is the thing I have in my house. You know, I think about all the features that we cut. I'm like, you know, how many people have, concern, have complained about the fact that they can't open the lid of the printer because it's up next to the wall? Pretty much zero. It didn't really matter. That's a thing that didn't matter. We spent so much emotional energy thinking about that and what it really meant. At the end of the day, it didn't matter. Like, sometimes, especially when you're doing a hardware startup, just buy a freaking hinge. It's just a hinge. Focus on what's really important. Think about who you are as the user and make sure that it works. And to conclude, this is my house. Um, you can see the Form 1 off in the corner. This is my workshop. And it works. It works for me. Like, we set out to make a thing that we wanted to have ourselves. We thought about, we're engineering students. Um, we're not going to have a 3D printer anymore after we graduate. Let's make something for us. And then we did. And I have it in my house. And I'm very happy about it. And you guys should go check it out in the outside. So hopefully, the, you know, this was a useful thing for you guys. And thank you again for coming to Solid 2014. And I hope to see you guys all again next year.